So, um, delighted to be here this evening with Peter Lomas of Raspberry Pi. Thank you very much for taking the time to answer a few of our questions tonight. Um, I think one of the things that it, it's probably really useful for us to talk about is, is where Raspberry Pi started. I know you, you came from industry as, as an engineer, but you teamed up with uh, you know, a, a crowd of Cambridge University academics. So, so what, what's the story there? Well, that's right. I mean, I think what had really happened is that at, at Cambridge University, they'd seen depleted intake for the science subjects, especially in computer science. Mm -hmm. And we'd seen exactly the same thing for electronic engineering actually recruiting into the company. And it was just a chance conversation that I had with Alan Mycroft. I'd been down to Imperial College um, to see some work that we'd actually built uh, for Imperial College. And they said, why don't you come down and actually see it working? And we we're going to have a bit of a session with some other academics and we're going to talk about what we're doing and where we're going next. And we were just walking across Hyde Park and we just got onto the conversation that the skill base that was coming into um, the university and the skill base that was coming into industry didn't seem to have that practical knowledge that we'd seen before. And we started to speculate why that was. And I think what we realised fairly, fairly quickly, and I think we already knew it, is that children didn't mess with things anymore. Everything is pre-packaged, it's pre-bundled, it's prefabricated. It's also extremely difficult to do anything other than what it's been programmed to do. And of course, that is an industry model. That's what they want to do. They want to sell the packaged product. So we talked about it and it sort of evolved. They already had an idea that what they'd like to do is give a little circuit board, ideally running something like Python, to the pre-undergraduates, i.e. in the June or July before they started in September. And the challenge was go away and do something with this and bring it back because it would then get them into the situation where they'd actually look at creating something. And that's really where Raspberry Pi had started. Eben had worked on it a few years earlier. Um, and I just thought, that's just brilliant. That's exactly what we need. And I came from Manchester University. I could see it would work there too. But also it would work, it's almost, I could give it to, um, I could mail one out to a potential recruit and say, do something with this and bring it back. By the way, it's for engineering. So you'll have to do something in hardware with it. But of course, you know, computers are ubiquitous now. So the mixture of hardware, software, and now, of course, the internet, all roll into, into one. And so it's important now we try and get people who are, you know, like what we used to call them cross-threaded engineers that could program and develop engineering products. You know, they actually do the actual electronic engineering as well, because you needed to know how to partition the problem up. And so we just thought this was just going to be a brilliant way of, of doing it. And so at that point, the concept of Raspberry Pi was born. But it was a year or so later before we actually came up with the idea of calling it Raspberry Pi, making it into a charitable foundation. We'd already had a go, I mean, in the evenings, uh, my team of engineers, we'd had a go at trying to make a Raspberry Pi. Mm -hmm. But we were just frustrated with the fact that we just needed so many extra bits and we couldn't get anywhere close to the imagined price point that we had. So when you, when you set out to do this as an engineering challenge, did you have a price point in mind that, you know, in order for this to be as ubiquitous as you wanted it to be, how, how cheap did you, did you have to produce it? Yeah, well, how cheap was a difficult question. I mean, we want, I mean, it's the usual thing. You want every piece of functionality you can imagine for nothing tomorrow. But life isn't like that. So we, we had to cut our cloth according to our target. And I think the thing, I think Alan Mycroft really hit it on the head when he said that you know, it really needs to be cheap enough to break. It needs to be so that the activation energy of actually getting in there and actually doing something to it had to be sufficiently set at a low level that you wouldn't worry about breaking it. You know, you can't imagine somebody taking one of the new, you know, the commercial products today apart. A, they probably find it extremely difficult to find their way into it. But even then, there'd be no, nothing to access, nothing to modify, nothing to change. And so we thought that you know, the price point was really important. And that's where the $25 and $35 price points came from. I mean, and that's presumably got easier, has it, as the price of processors and, and chips has, has come down? Or was that, does that actually get harder? Because actually, obviously, technology advances, you want these things to do more complex. 
I think you've got, you know, it's Moore's law, isn't it? The, thing, the things do more every couple of years. And I think what happened was, is the first attempt, we just weren't quite there on the curve because it couldn't do enough. You know, we couldn't see that doing, um, you know, a 480 by, you know, 600 or 800 display in 12 colours or something, or 16 colours even, would actually uh, attract children. It had to have more than that to get them at least interested in it. And also, presumably, there's a the difficulty that, as you said, you know, technology now, my, my two-year-old can play with my phone and my iPad because the icons and touchscreens are so simple to use. But the difficulty then is obviously that because children are used to that, being faced with something, as you say, that's got limited, you know, limited colour, limited sort of visual appeal. Was it quite hard to get, to get over that, to find a way of making well, it fun, making it obviously fun? I, I think the, the real break point came um, with the BCM2835 because the power of the chip gave us everything that we needed in terms of functionality. It gave us HDMI and it gave us graphics. And those are the two things that, you know, that really attract people to the current crop of products, isn't it? Really good graphics and really good um, technology that allows them to connect to things. And so it was, just, it was just that chip. It had such a high level of integration and met our price point expectations that we were just able to do it. If you actually break a Raspberry Pi down and you look at sort of the equation, it's really very simple. It's the processor, it's a memory, and it's a device that gives us the, two eth uh, the Ethernet and the two uh, USBs. The rest is just a little bit of supporting technology to make that happen and a load of connectors. And how did you know that that was going to work? So who did you test this on? Obviously, you know, you played around with it, presumably yourself in the lab. But, I mean, did you, did you take it out to schools? Did, did you give it to undergraduates? Well, no, I mean, we, we just... We just knew. <laughs> well, well, no, we didn't, we didn't know. This is where the power of the internet really comes into play. Um, it was Rory Allen jones did something on BBC with a very early prototype. And we put up the Raspberry Pi um, org website. And then we started to publish some information about, about what we were doing. And so we, we were developing um, you know, the engineering product up in, up in Manchester. And we were there and um, Evan just phoned me and said, you know how we were going to build maybe 10,000 for the undergraduates and that over the next couple of years? Um, we've got, you know, 200,000 plus expressions of interest. Because I think the price point coupled with the outline specification had really got, had really attracted people to the, to the concept. Do you know how many you have sold now? To the nearest 100,000? <laughs> We're, 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 we're coasting, we're coasting towards half a million. Um, it's always difficult because there's obviously quite a lot in the pipeline. I mean, our, our, the, the, the factory in Pencoed, Sony's factory in Pencoed in Wales is making um, about two and a half to 3,000 a day. And they're, they're, they're flat out making those. And the, the problem that we've had, um, I, I termed it a success failure where we have a, almost an exponential ramp in requirement and trying to keep up with that and to satisfy the demand has been almost impossible with the, you know, with the inevitable delays in fabbing wafers for, for silicon. Yeah, yeah. Well, it's a great problem to have, though, at the end of the day, isn't it? So. It's, a, it's a brilliant problem to have. I mean, I have to say that certainly from my personal view, I never expected it to be as widespread as this and to be really taken into people's hearts to, to be used. But I think two things have caused that. One is the fact that the internet has allowed a lot of people to get to know about it very quickly. It's also allowed a lot of people to contribute. And so, as the foundation, we have the core group of trustees. But in reality, I don't think we're, we're not doing um, the bulk of the work. We have a lot of dedicated supporters who've done a lot of the software development. We've got, a, oh, no, they're all over the world. And then we've got the community that's developed around Raspberry Pi who are doing phenomenal things. I was at a, what is it's quaintly termed a, a Raspberry Jam. <laughs> I hadn't heard where, of that. Where we've got, you know, we've got children, we've got adults, um, we've got educationalists all coming together to share what they've been doing with, with the Raspberry Pi already. That's wonderful. And, and it, it is just fantastic to see what, 
what, you know, what these people are coming up with. And so I think what's really, what, what really heartens me about it is captured people's imaginations and it's captured their inventiveness. So, so I was going to ask you, you know, why Raspberry Pi obviously started as a foundation, but I'm already picking up from so many of your comments that there is a sort of fundamental altruism, really, in, in all your expectations, that you just want this to make a difference. There are certain sort of, if you like, social goals and quite practical goals, though, as well, that you wanted to achieve. But yeah. you know, was the foundation always I mean, a very clear aim? I think it was. I mean, I think the, the problem was is that being realistic, if you, if you put this in a commercial setting and you overload the design and development with all the commercial costs and you overload it with, you know, all the things that, that the, the foundation uh, trustees have basically done for free and a lot of other people have done for free to help get this off the ground, it probably wasn't a tenable thing to do. And we just wanted it to happen. We had, it just had to happen. We all were of a mind, this just had to happen. And one of the questions that, that we are just fascinated with here at the OII, and it will come up again, I think, in our awards that we make this evening, but it is this question about, well, what is it that's special about the internet that, that makes people want to help each other, makes people want to collaborate on projects without asking for money, without necessarily asking about IP? Because it doesn't happen as much as it should, I think, you know, in the, the, the non-internet environment. And you seem to have experienced that, you know, at first hand. Oh, absolutely. I think, I think what it allows people to do is promote their idea to a much wider audience. And it only needs 2% of that audience to be enthusiastic, to have a massive number of people that want to be involved in it. I mean, there's been, you know, lots of spin-off businesses that have arrived as a result of Raspberry Pi. And as I was saying, I mean, there's one that really surprised me is there's 50 different types of cases from one that's made out of a paper, well, fairly stiff paper that you can cut out, ones that are made out of Lego, ones that are made out of plastic, and one that looks as though it's made out of titanium to make sure that you never get to your pie in a, in a million years, but it's all fantastic because it's all inventiveness, it's all designer driven. And I, I don't even think that they're, you know, they're looking at it and then what they find is that somebody will then email them and say, hey, I really like that, can I have one? And then another hundred people will email them and say, that's really nice, can I have one? And all of a sudden, there's a business. There's an opportunity for a business. So that, I mean, that answers another of my questions, which is, you know, you, wouldn't you have expected something like this to be identified as a gap in the market, you know, by industry, you know, years and years ago. Why did it take a university? Is this something, do we not innovate, you know, enough in the technology industries in the UK? But it sounds as if you think that's maybe not, not true. No, I think, I think what did it is we set such an aggressively low price point that the industry would, would actually walk away from it because it, it has no, it has no financial model that will, that would be sustainable. But that was when we were only going to make a few, a few thousand. So it was, it was basically, you know, okay, the, all the trustees, um, you know, basically put in money and effort to make this happen and actually stumped up the cash to build the first run in, Ch in China. Um, it was only then when it took off and we had the advantage of the volume and scale that all of a sudden it all becomes so much easier. It's this, it's this problem of, of every new idea is almost dragged down by the fact that it needs to get started. It's this big wheel that needs to start turning. And before you get to point X, you can't do Y. But we weren't, we weren't sort of, um, we didn't have that problem because we could just do it, because we were paying for it. I mean, in the first, in the first analysis, we thought we might lose, lose five or seven dollars per board. But we felt that because we were trying to make a point and try and generate the enthusiasm and interest, that that was worth doing. Even if it failed at that point, we'd then understand better what we needed to do. I mean, there's one, I was reflecting on one hairy moment where in the early discussions, to try and meet the price point, we were going to throw off the internet connection. My goodness. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it doesn't, it doesn't bear thinking about. You know, the, the beauty about the, the foundation is that all the trustees come from different backgrounds. 
And so we all had our different opinions but it, and different you know, attitude to what it could do. I'm very much an engineer, so I was very in for the GPIO ports, the ability to connect at the lowest level. So you could then connect something to your Pi. And then the other guys were saying, well, look, we've got this internet connection we can download, we can do software. It gives us massive opportunities for connectivity and all sorts of projects then become possible. And then when you look at it now, the, the Pi's almost got the, all the layers that you, you want. You could connect um, just a very simple sensor to a physical real world device and you can then transmit that using your Pi out over the internet and you can even come back into your Pi and control something and a lot of people are doing that. And in the, you know, in the environment where the internet of things is now becoming superbly topical, mm -hmm. it means that people at home, you know, the modifiers, the hackers, the inventors have actually got a platform that's fairly cheap that they can go and try their ideas on. Mm. And do you have any sense as to who mainly are buying these and using them? I mean, obviously, you know, the idea originally was, as you say, you know, children, teenagers, people hoping to, to study in this area. But, but is there increasing evidence that it's, you know, it's, it, it's adults, like you say, it's ah. people who want to just muck around, tinker with their technology, you know, hook things up at home? We get, we get quite a lot of people saying, oh, I know. When I was a lad, I used to have a Sinclair Spectrum and, and, and that sort of thing. And it, it's sort of going back to the, to the bygone days and recreating a little bit of their youth. But that's no bad thing because what's happening now is they're getting a Raspberry Pi and they're in, infecting their children with that enthusiasm. Because I think that, that, would, that was the key thing. Um, in terms of who buys them, certainly a lot of the maker community have bought them. Um, and also a lot of teachers have as well to, to understand the technology. A lot of universities have them. I think, you know, if we, we always keep coming back at, at, at most of our meetings and we say, right, let's go back to our original aims and objectives and just, just take a reading. Are we, are we on, the, on the right course? And I think we are because I think what we've realised is that Education is much more diverse than perhaps we... Well, no, I, mean, I, think, I think Eben and, 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 and um, the other guys had got it. I'd probably not quite seen it as much as they had, that it's a much more diverse community of education. And we're seeing now the after-school clubs, you know, the intra-school clubs, uh, these hack spaces, are all creating an environment where children can develop their skill. Yeah. And they can also use their imagination. Yeah. We, um, I mean, some of the research that we do here touches on what tends to be called informal learning, so learning outside, a, you know, an education, a school environment. And certainly in relation to the internet, there's, there's a, lot of, a lot of research that shows that, that often it is, it's the mucking around at home that, that, that is, does, the does the most, if you like, for building skills and, you know, the range of skills that people can then sort of express and develop and so on. So it's going to be very interesting, I think, with your product to see actually whether the, the, the tinkering uh, you know, the making, the programming at home actually has sort of similar effect. Because certainly from our perspective, I think one of the reasons why we wanted you to come tonight and why we think Raspberry Pi is so fantastic is that you look at, you know, you look at Jonathan Zittron's work, uh, you know, the great Harvard and XOR academic, and his great concern was that you, you know, the internet eventually becomes just a coffee maker, that it loses this capacity for what he calls sort of generativity, you know, that, that you, can, you can hack things, change things, you can, you know, it's constantly developing and, and, and sort of mutating. And I think that, you know, his worst fear, if you like, was, you know, the, the sort of the beautiful Apple, Apple device in a way, you know, which is very much a closed system. And I think that, you know, one of the things that excites us enormously about what you're doing is that it's, it's making, hacking, making, tinkering cool again. And it's, it's not, you know, it's not even that it's teaching kids to do it, it's that it's, it's making it fun. Um, so, you know, I think that the, the work that you've accomplished is amazing. We probably only have a few more minutes. I just wanted to ask you maybe, you know, some more future looking questions. You, you've clearly been surprised by the, sort of the extent of the success you've had already in the UK. And I just wondered about you know, looking internationally. You know, on the one hand, you, know, you read articles about Roger Pai suggesting that, that you know, it's going gonna, it's gonna to completely change the way you know, e-government happens in, 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 in less developed countries because it's a sort of, you know, cheap computing form. Um, is that something that you, know, you, you talk about at all within the foundation? Do you have grander goals now? or you? Well, we talk about it, um, but I think you know, our focus has been very much in the education. 
and what we're looking to do is understand how we can roll out the educational package, if you like, that has Raspberry Pi, how that could be used in the classroom, the development of modules across the curricula, because you don't, you know, physics could use it, uh, mathematics can use it, it can be used everywhere as a tool, which, after all, is what computers were originally invented yeah, for. And somehow, with all this packaged product, we seem to forget that, that they are a general purpose tool that can be used, as long as you can see into it and understand how to harness it. I mean, we, we deliberately um, left um, legacy interfaces on there to try and make sure that we could give connectivity across the world and that people could potentially run a Raspberry Pi off a solar cell. It has that capability. Um, the problem that they may then have is to try and acquire internet connectivity, of course, that would always be a challenge. But all these things, you know, can come later. The, the, the primary goal at the moment is to, is to try and push for our original target of getting this into education, whatever form that would take, and really get back to the point where we, we strip away you know, the IT and get back to the engineering, the software engineering and the hardware engineering that involves the product. As you said, from a packaged product, somebody has to be able to make the next generation of packaged products. Yeah. Well, we think you're just doing a wonderful job and you know, really grateful for you coming to the OI this evening. Thank you very much well, for, you. for the pleasure. interview. Thank you.